Hello and welcome to The Fix. I'm Michael Walker. Today I'm joined by Aaron Bastani. What's up? How are you doing? Uh, good to see you again, Michael. Very good to see you, Aaron. Always a pleasure. Uh, we are in day three of the UCU strike. Uh, Britain's lecturers are on strike due to changes in their pensions. We're not going to talk about that now, but later I will be interviewing Amelia Horgan, uh, who's going to tell us all the details about that in this section. We don't normally do this, but we're going to dedicate this episode to a very special person who's had a very good week. Who's that? Jeremy Corbyn's lawyer. OK. I don't know who they are, but uh, they've, they've done some very good social media are work. Are you sure it wasn't just Seamus Milne sort of trying to pull a fast one? I don't, look, it was, a legal, it was a legal letter. I think if Seamus Milne pretended to be a lawyer, that would, you know, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd be in another legal quagmire. I just thought it was very well penned. Very well very, penned. Very, very well communicated. Um, so as we talked about a lot last week on various Navarra shows, uh, there was a botched smear attempt at Jeremy Corbyn saying he had... Go on, go on, Michael. You're, you're, obstru you're obstructing the camera to oh, me. I'm obstructing fine. your camera. See, if I was doing this, go on, they'd be yeah, the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Okay, sorry. That's fine, man. You can see Aaron now, right? Because Michael's so eager, right? Yeah. Michael is such an eager be I'm going to lean back. To talk about... What are you going to Ben Bradley? Ben Bradley. Okay, so Ben Bradley, he had smeared Corbyn by saying he had sold information. Yeah, that's right. British state secrets to check spies. What secrets? Uh, we've, we've already been through this. It was what, what Thatcher was going to wear the next day. What state these kind of things. No, what state secrets? Did, I really want to know. What state secrets did Britain have in the 1980s? Well, we had loads of state secrets in the 1980s. What, how to start estate agents? How to privatise shit? I don't know. I don't all know. The, anyway. All, all, the good, all the good state secrets were in the 50s or 60s. Jet technology, nuclear technology, all that stuff. Oh, you think we didn't have enough international uh, power and really. cachet for anyone to actually even really. want our secrets. I mean, I mean, realistically, I mean, maybe a few little things, but no, not really, no. Yeah, potentially. So you think spies just wouldn't even have bothered? They'd want to know about the location of assets and stuff, but it wouldn't be like big state secrets. Yeah, we're like military power. hardware and stuff, you know? Anyway, we're, we're derieving. Uh, Sorry, we've gone all... Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn didn't sell spies no. to the Czechs, uh, and Bed Bradley had to give a grovelling apology. Mm. Uh, so Corbyn got his lawyers on bed, Bradley, and said, you have libelled Jeremy Corbyn, leader of the Labour Party. Uh, and not only should you delete the tweet, not only should you donate £10,000 to a charity in Ben Bradley's constituency, mm. but you should tweet an apology with two fateful words at the end. Right. What were they? Please retweet. But you know, with tweets, the problem is when you say please retweet, Nobody ever retweets it. Yeah, normally it looks a bit desperate if you right. say please retweet. Right. right, but maybe that was a mistake on Corbyn's lawyer's behalf. Well, I think there's something about Ben Bradley where people really believed it, people really listened to this guy, people really wanted to respect this request and retweet the tweet. Right, because he meant it. He really meant it. He really wanted it to be retweeted. And the British people have retweeted this tweet. I think we're going to get it up. 50,000 times, very no, impressive. No, that's, that's Photoshop. It's really 50,000. That's 50,000. It makes it the most tweeted tweet by a Tory politician ever, including the Prime Minister. I've heard that it's got more retweets than all the tweets put together by every Tory for 2018. Is that correct? For 2018, yes. Is that correct? I mean, it might be ever. I don't know. I haven't done that some. Well, if it carries on at the present rate, because it only went up, what, Saturday night? It went up on... Saturday night, yeah. So he tried, he, he he tried to it, bury it. He tried to bury it with well a lot done, of retweets right? and he did it at 10.30, but obviously we weren't going to let him bury it. And it's exploded. Uh, Very sad. I mean, he's kind of ended his career, right? Yeah, I think I so. I suspect. Cause the majority well, they was... overpromoted him because he, he became a vice chair of the party at the age of 28. Very impressive. Yeah. Then it turned out he wanted to give vasectomies to the poor um, or to the unemployed specifically. Uh, and He's from the eugenics wing of the Tory party. Yeah, which I think probably... It had its moment a couple of months ago, but I think it's cachets on, the, on a downward trend. Yeah, I mean, his, his majority, I think, is 1,080. Mm. There was unseat at the weekend in Mansfield. He comes across as just an idiot, so I, I'd put money on Labour winning that seat. They should have won it, actually, at the last general mm. election if it wasn't for the idiocy of Labour Party HQ and the likes of Ian McNichol, more of which later. Mm -hmm. uh, I predict a 10,000 Labour majority. In Ben Bradley's seat of Mansfield. I think the good people of Mansfield... 10,000. 10,000. I like that. Let's aim for 10,000. 10,000. Look, it's not as many retweets as Ben Bradley got. 
Okay, but it's still pretty impressive. Anyway, I'm not sure if we're going to get it up, but this means that Sebastian Payne, political correspondent at the FT, right. has potentially had one prediction come true. It doesn't happen very often. And this, inch, much, this is the only one, right? By inch, the Conservatives are understanding how to communicate on social media. He's right. Happened quicker than we thought. They've gone viral. They've gone viral. I mean, hey, look, Jeremy Corbyn doesn't get many tweets 50k. That's yeah. a lot of tweets. He gets quite a few, to be honest. But 50k, I mean, not yeah, very yeah, often, yeah. right? I think the last one was about Trump. So right, nothing, nothing yeah, the like, NHS. Nothing like beefing Trump to get a lot of retweets. Uh, we're going to move on to the next story. Um, we had some big news on Friday night, which was a giant oh my God. of the Labour movement. Oh, my God, yeah. Absolute giant. A latter-day Keir Hardy. Uh, resigned. He's gone. Who are we talking about, Aaron? We're talking about Ian McNichol, who is the gentleman on your screen right now. Former GMB man, Ian McNichol. He was the General Secretary of the Labour Party since 2011. He wasn't Ed Miliband's first pick. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I, I personally hold him responsible for the fact that Labour aren't in 10 Downing Street right now. Uh, I wrote an article for Navarra saying why the next General Secretary should be democratic elected. We'll talk about that in a second. But I briefly, and it was a brief excursus over his record as General Secretary, which includes using the funds of the organisation to prohibit 130,000 members legally from voting for their next party leader. Oh, that's not very nice. Which includes the protracted defunding of critical marginals, which Labour broadly won anyway. Which includes the fact that he passes to Labour's south side headquarters for the leader of the opposition's team were revoked on the night of the general election at the behest of Ian McNichol. Why? Because there was a presumption that they would lose, there would be a coup immediately, and that they would install a Labour establishment uh, favourite instead in a, in a, a you know, consequent mm. leadership election. So, no love lost for Ian McNichol. No love lost for Ian McNichol. Why has it happened now, do you know? Any insight? A few, there's a few, basically there's a couple of people in the Midlands who've been naughty. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they've been involved in um, ongoing uh, allegations around just inappropriate behaviour in workplaces. Mm. McNichol wouldn't get rid of them. None of it's been proven. This is the hearsay that I'm just, you know, going back over again, which you can find, I think it's on Huffington Post it was mentioned explicitly. It's the only place that's mentioned it. Um, and he, he didn't deal with it. And they mm. said, enough is enough. I think on Tuesday, Jeremy Corbyn and Carrie Murphy went to see him. They said, Ian, you're a loser. <laughs> you're a shell. You seem to get nothing right. Maybe it's time you moved on. Yeah. And the gossip is that he will become a lord. So he's going to the right place. Lord McNichol. Lord, well, I mean, it'll be Lord something else. It'll be, it'll be like Lord McAllen of Stranra. I mean, they get these weird names, right? <laughs> God knows what it'll be. <laughs> But he's gone, he's a goner. He's gone, he's a goner. What's going to happen now? Who's going to replace him and how are they going to replace him? So at the moment, United the favourites. Uh, they have a candidate, Jenny Formby. She's their South East coordinator. Excellent. Some people are saying Andrew Murray would be phenomenal. He was mm. a member of the Communist Party until 2016. It would terrify the melts in the PLP. Yeah. More importantly, forget his political history. He's very effective. He knows what he's doing. He's been key. It was revealed today, actually. He's been a consultant in terms of Labour's position on Brexit. He was seconded into the leader's office during the election. He's good at his job. Mm. He's effective at politics. He's all of the things which the melts can't do. He's all of the things which the losers are so terrible at. So it's time we've got somebody like Andrew Murray, and he's not my personal favourite. I don't think that's how it works. I think, like I said, it should be elected. Mm. But uh, uh, it looks like it'll be Jenny Formby. Because obviously I think most people would agree... The Labour Party isn't just, you know, a progressive party, quote-unquote. The majority of its members are women. And yet, London Mayor is a man, most MPs are men, the leader's a man, the deputy leader's a man. Um, so, yeah, I think a woman would have to take the role. I, like I say, would like to see it democratically elected. Mm. Yeah, I mean, my, I'd like to see it democratically elected in the future. I'd like there to be a bit of creative tension in an organisation. And I think shoo-ins, if it looks like a coronation, that's not particularly helpful. It looks bad, but, right, in a way. Well, I don't think optics matter that much, to be honest, because no, we all know that in elections, no one cares who the general secretary is or, or how they got the job. 
So I think it's more about the effect on the organisation. But I, think I, don't, I, I, I mean for party members. I mm. don't mean for the audience. Like the mass, I mean, like, you know, it's, it's again, this is what's interesting, right? McNichol trended on Saturday night on Twitter. The general sector of the Labour Party is trending on Twitter. Mm. So why is that? It's not because most Brits even know who the guy is. It's because Labour has 600,000 members, I think 570,000, mm -hmm. and most of them now are really engaged. Yeah, most of them are engaged. I mean, it changes all the time, right? Most of them are engaged. Most of them probably know this guy, probably don't like him. So I think it's bad optics for it to be a coronation backroom deals. Oh, here we go. What's this? Mr. Oh, Bean. Mr. Bean. What are we looking at now? McNichol. Oh, yeah, this, is, this is everyone. McNichol hasn't resigned yet. Oh, fake news. There you extra, go. extra fake news. It wasn't fake news. It wasn't fake news. No, he's gone, fortunately. <laughs> um, so... So yes, it's bad optics for those people, the party members. Mm -hmm. And if we want to see a party of a million people, uh, I would submit that uh, you need to open up more roles. Because people are going to give their all, they're going to give their weekends, they're going to give their late nights, because they really believe they have a stake, not just ideologically with this manifesto, because they agree with it, but also in the decision-making processes fundamentally. Also, I mean, the manifesto is fabulous. The Labour Party still needs wholesale transformation. So, I mean, we, we do want a disruptor in there. We want a disruptor. Uh, we're you gonna love move your on. Silicon Valley chat, don't you, Michael? Yeah, we're going to need a disruptor. We need, we need a project manager disruptor. We need a... We Not need a project a, manager. Really. Go, go and set. We want a Steve Jobs. We need beanbags. <laughs> we need HQ full of beanbags, sand pits, and ex-Google execs. Ant farms. Hey, maybe you should be the next general secretary. Uh, I, I want to work for you. This sounds like a great office. Mm. Free beers, craft beer. Maybe I'll apply. That'd be good, right? Craft beer. Free craft beer. We'll have beer. craft beer. We'll have bean bags. Pizza. We'll have memes. Vegan we'll pizzas. We'll have a meme department. <laughs> You're basically describing the failed BuzzFeed, right? Are, you calling, are we calling BuzzFeed the failed BuzzFeed now? Well, Jim Watson, who to my mind is the best young journalist in this country, has now left. Yeah. Although apparently... To the failing Guardian, though. <laughs> but failing because of a secular crisis yeah. of like print media. It's online operations doing no, very well. it's online operations If it got rid of its well. print operation, it would make money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but apparently this is... This is extraneous to the conversation. Melinda Gates wants to buy BuzzFeed. Wow. So that's a lot of money, right? Buy shares in BuzzFeed. Can we buy shares in <laughs> no, BuzzFeed? No. Jim watson has gone. Sell BuzzFeed. No, but if Melinda Gates buy stocks go up when you're gonna have a merger. Yeah, this is what this, this is, is what, what Labour H HQ should look like. This in is what Labour HQ will look like under Secretary General Michael Walker. Mm. It looks look. a bit <laughs> Yeah. It looks a bit like Port Cullis House where the MPs hang out. That place is a not very fucking, productive. That is a nightmare, that place. All right, we're going to move on to our next big story of the day. Well, this is our only big story of the day, because the last one was the story of the week. Although it's been a big, big... I mean, normally we do two stories on the fix, right? Those are two massive stories. Two massive stories. Especially McNichols, a big story. Just be brief, let's finish that. This was the final barrier to basically, like, the left taking over the Labour mm. Party. They have the NEC, they have the leadership. Uh, they're doing pretty well in candidate selection. They're doing pretty well in, even in local government now with Haringey. Robin Wales is now, there's a trigger ballot. It mm -hmm. looks like he's going to probably not win that. Um, so things are going really well. Yeah, things are going really well, but it's not the final barrier. That's not true. Because the PLP, whilst it's still incredibly Corbyn sceptic, right, okay, that's yes. what could bring down a Corbyn government. So even if you control... what At the moment, what, what's happened is Corbynites control the machine. True. And they control the leadership. True. But councillors, the PLP, these are all incredibly important aspects of the party, which is why when people try and make out that these moves to increase the power of the left within the machine are anti-pluralistic, um, they're ignoring those sections of the party which are still dominated by another faction. Labour is still very plural in a slightly dysfunctional so, way. So what would you say is the final barrier? Mandatory selection? Mandatory selection, yeah. And, and then, finally, this will be the moment of... Conclusive ecstasy yep. for the left in the Labour Party. Oh, I want to know what's going to happen. What? Well, if there's mandatory selection, that would be it. Oh, right? that was it, right. I thought you were going to tell me one more thing. I thought there was like this secret ecstatic. Well, we already have sort of, thing. we already have reselections for councillors. Yep. So that's, that's just people undoing it because people don't know the ropes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've heard some amazing stories about reselections of councillors. This will be key, though, in terms of the next General Secretary because not everyone on the left is in favour of mandatory reselection. So we want to make sure that not only does the party become more favourable to Corbyn, it becomes more favourable to democracy in general. We're going to move to the next story. Let's Aaron. move to the next story. I had a great vignette about a councillor. We won't go there. Really? I don't, I don't want to do a Ben Bradley. Shove it in there afterwards. All right, we're going to talk about the customs union. Corbyn gave a speech today uh, establishing Labour's Brexit position or further developing Labour's Brexit position. I think we're going to see a little bit of that now. Can we get that up? 
We will remain close to the EU, that's obvious. Every country, whether it's Turkey, Switzerland or Norway, that is geographically close to the EU without being an EU member state has some sort of close relationship with the EU. There are some more advantageous than others and Britain will need a bespoke negotiated relationship of its own. Labour would seek to remain in a customs union with the EU and within the single market. Labour spelled out the need for a stable transition period last summer. Both the TUC and the CBI agree on that. We thought the government had accepted that case, but they now seem to be, very surprisingly, in disarray on this issue yet again. Time after time with this government, anything agreed at breakfast is being briefed against by lunch and abandoned by tea time. Up to now, so watching that, our impressions are that he should have straightened his tie and that he might need to trim his beard. Eh, I said, I said uh, centred, because he's done it nicely, then obviously somebody's put the clip mic on him and they've not put it back properly. Oh, conspiracy. I wonder who put the, the clip media, mic on. It's a media conspiracy. It's a media conspiracy to wonky his tie when he's Because he's got a great, speech. he's wearing a great suit, lovely Just shirt. he's getting business on side. Um, anyway, what was announced today was that Labour would support Britain staying in a customs union. Yeah. Uh, this is after the Tories reaffirmed that they would leave it yeah. after their meeting last week in Chequers, which is the Prime Minister's retreat. Uh, what do you make of this, Aaron? Do you well, think Britain should stay in a customs union? It's the correct position. I mean, it's the only position I think that... I, I, OK, let's be serious. It's the most progressive outcome that right now mm -hmm. the majority of the British electorate would back. So what does it mean, fundamentally, the customs union, this customs union would be a very different set of arrangements to the EEA, the European Economic Area, or the EFTA, the European Free Trade Association. So you have what are called variable geometries in the European project. You have the Eurozone, you have the EU, you have the EEA, you have the EFTA. This proposal would add almost an, another concentric circle, which would be a new customs arrangement uh, just with the UK, and it would be on just goods. Well, so the customs union always is on goods. Yeah. So at the moment, so the option, if we say we're going to join the customs union, we'd be exactly like Turkey. Um, so the customs union means that you have free trade in goods, you don't have free trade in services, which means you don't have to sign up to the four freedoms of movement of capital, labour. I don't know what the other two ones are. Everyone always says the four, but people only remember two of them, I think. Oh, goods, services, people. LSE, LSE, LSE grad, Michael Walker. Goods, services, people... What's the fourth one? Hey, I'm a Eurosceptic. Okay, right, it doesn't matter. I think it's anyway. good services, people and capital, no? Yeah. Good services, people, capital. Yes, that's it. All right, we, right. Got, to, we got to all four. We got that. Um, so the customs union means you have free trade in goods. You don't have to check a lorry as it goes across the channel. What this does mean is you have exactly the same trade agreements with the external world, with the outside world, yeah. as everyone else in the EU. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise Britain could import something from America on its trade agreement That's on right. lower terms than, yeah. than Europe. So right now, for instance, when uh, Britain's uh, trade agreements with non-European countries like Brazil or the US, that's decided through the World Trade Organization, the WTO. We have nobody at the WTO, right? The EU, the Commission, uh, basically decides European trade deals through mm -hmm. the WTO. So the Commission is unelected. The proposal is that would still happen, but there'd be quite a lot of uh, deliberation conversation between the Brits, between the European Commission beforehand. So to be, if we're being honest, this is not propaganda, this is not bullshit. It is actually recentering sovereignty around trade arrangements back in Britain, quite significantly, whilst keeping a customs union, whilst protecting jobs, wages, the economy, so to speak. So I, to be honest, I think it is a really good compromise. That's if the EU accept it. That's the thing, yeah. So do you think the EU will accept Britain to stay part of the customs union but not become completely dependent on them for external trade deals? Will they be happy to have a third party involved? I don't think they would be, because obviously Britain is getting the good bits of being in the EU. It's access to the, the, you know, access to the single market. Uh, this huge market is the world's largest market on its doorstep. And yet it's not tying itself into the free movement of people. You know, so you, we would not have freedom of movement anymore. Uh, a number of other arrangements it wouldn't be paying into. So it's, it's hard to see people like Guy Verhofstadt, for instance, mm. or Jean-Claude Juncker, being particularly happy 
But in a way, I think that's part of the genius of this proposal, is that it's going to really piss off Farage and the hardcore Brexiteers, and it's really going to piss off people, quite frankly, who I view as undemocratic, anti-democratic, within the European project. And in a way, that's where you want to be, mm -hmm. especially uh, for a politician, Jeremy Corbyn, who historically has been very critical of the European project more broadly. So something we've not mentioned yet is very important, is that they would want certain opt-outs on privatisation directives and state aid. Uh, so, for instance, Paul Talbot, mm -hmm. um, you know, within the EU, there's very few things this really applies to. Steel is undeniable. Um, the kinds of state intervention that <coughs> we would want to put in there, for instance, uh, you couldn't do it in the EU. We would want this customs union, and we'd want certain opt-outs around things like that, for instance. So or, what? What I think is that they might be able to get the thing about trade deals, because I think the idea that we have some input when they sign a new trade deal with another country probably wouldn't be that controversial because we have quite similar interests anyway. Yeah. Anything which gave us opt-outs from the European Court of Justice, i.e. state aid for Port Talbot, I think is going to be harder. Yes. Um, well, that would be, be the red we'll line. we'll wait and see. Yeah. Um, anyway, it had some, Corbyn got some unlikely support today, which was from Business the CBI. I don't know if we're going to get a headline up there. So the... Confederate of British Industries and the Institute of Directors have both said that Corbyn's proposal on the customs union is a positive one. They're more in favour of Labour's Brexit position than the Tories one. They will still back the Tories in the next general election. They will still back the Tories in the next general election. Because they're fucking idiots Obviously. and they let down their members. Yeah. Well, at the bottom of the statement supporting the customs union position, um, the CBI put that they are also very unhappy about Corbyn's proposals to nationalise some stuff. Yeah, because they're the party. Literally, particularly in their the, interest. The, the Tory party could literally have a national policy of drilling a hole into everybody's heads and turning puppies into sausages, and the CBI would still back them because, you know, there's a nexus of political power and economic power, and it runs straight through the Tory party and the CBI. It's, it's like they're twins. Mm. So no matter what Labour do, uh, they won't support them, which makes that a remarkable statement. This is risky, because we haven't discussed this before, but why could this announcement on the customs union bring down Theresa May? Well, fundamentally, Labour's position on this has been an outgrowth of a rebellion amongst her own backbenchers, mm -hmm. including woke Anna Subri. Uh, again, very small majority. Uh, again, I'm going to make a prediction. Ben Bradley's going to lose by 10,000, Anna Subri, 5,000. Uh, notwithstanding that, uh, yes, it could, if the final deal goes to Parliament, which it's going to. It's going to be a vote on Brexit Day in 13 months. If it doesn't meet the red lines that Labour have outlined today, if it doesn't look like it, if it doesn't resemble it, then they will vote it down. The SNP will vote it down. The Lib Dems and, of course, these Tory backbenchers will vote it down. In which case, we could see it fail and we could see another general election. There's a vote coming sooner than that. Go on. Uh, so this is timed in a way because Anna Subri has put an amendment, Woke Subri, has put yep. an amendment to yep. a current trade bill yeah, yeah, yeah. which would commit Britain to staying in a customs union. Yeah. Um, the Tories are opposed to it. They've said we're leaving the customs union yeah. and we're, we don't plan to form a customs union. They yeah. want more divergence with EU which regulations. Which was checkers, right? Yeah, than any customs union could provide. Um, they've been, the Tories have been stalling on hearing this amendment for a long time. What this speech by Jeremy Corbyn does is it gives Labour justification to whip all their MPs to vote for Anna Soubry's amendment, um, which there'll be potentially enough Tory MPs in favour of as well to defeat the government. Um, the Tories are terrified if they lose this that they'll look incredibly weak. What they're hoping to do is get their rebellious MPs to vote for the amendment, no, to vote against the amendment, sorry, uh, to keep Jeremy Corbyn out of 10 Downing Street. So they're going to make this vote into a vote of confidence. If they lose, Theresa May is going to be under a lot of pressure to resign. But she's already under lots of pressure to resign. She's and going I, to be under a lot more pressure I don't to resign. think she will resign. But the, the key point is this. Labour's position today is very popular, as we've already seen the CBI is backing it. Um, so I don't think that come Brexit Day, which is in 13 months, mm. it'll be voted down. And I think there will have to be a general election. I just don't see how you have a government after that. So... People talk about a general election in 2022. I take it as a, as a given because of the Fixed Term Parliament Act. But I think Labour's offer today on Brexit is so clear. I mean, it's not, it's not crystal clear. It's still ambiguous because it's not them who are negotiating this. But it's a lot clearer than the Tories. And I think most reasonable people inclined to Lib Dems, the 48% Remainers, they have to know that most of the country either doesn't care or voted Remain and doesn't really want a second referendum or they voted Leave. So this is the best they're going to get. 
And I think actually it's going to, I think it's going to, I think it's going to draw a lot of people towards Jeremy Corbyn who otherwise weren't really that persuaded by him. Mm. Aaron, thank you for your insights on the weekend's news. Oh, my pleasure. Today's news. Uh, we're going to take a break now. We're going to look at a video that was made last Thursday on the first day of the UCU strike. And then we'll be back with Amelia Horgan to talk about the UCU strike. See you in about two minutes. Today is the first day of a strike involving 61 campuses uh, called by the University and Colleges Union over 40% cuts to their USS pension scheme. This strike is really important for the UCU. Essentially, it could determine the future of collective bargaining in the sector because if the universities defeat them here, academics may be in a lot of trouble. For me and a lot of people in my position, retirement and a defined benefit contribution is actually the last kind of form of job security that we have. So I don't know where I'm going to be working next year, if I'm going to be working next year. But I know that if I stay in academia, even if I bounce from contract to contract, I'll be able to plan for retirement with the current situation. I'll know that I'll have income in retirement, exactly what that is, and I can, I can plan for that. It's not a good situation to be on a defined contribution scheme and one that depends on the market. So it's, it's stripping away the last form of job security that I have and people like me have. The significance of this strike really cannot be overstated. The future of the sector is determined over the next 14 days. And if academics lose, well, it could have huge impacts on the rest of the sector. Marketization, pensions, holidays, everything could go. We're all in this together. We all have to take part in whatever way we can uh, in supporting this action. Not only that, it's totally legal for you to do so. Everybody can refuse to cross a picket line. Everybody should refuse to cross a picket line if they want to defend their pensions. We would encourage everyone who works at the university, whatever pension scheme they're in, to participate and support uh, the industrial action here. Simply because their pensions are going to be next. Students should not cross picket lines, even if their lectures are still on. It's really not that hard. Like, if you, if you can't... If you can't be able to go to the picket, just stay in bed. If students are wanting to support the strike, they need to be going on picket lines. They need to not go to classes during strike days. But most importantly, I think um, taking direct action. Um, I think that's going to be a way that people are going to win the strike. That means protest. That means occupations. That means sit-ins. Those are things that we need to be seeing students doing across the country. I think the strike's going to go really well. I think we're going to win this. I mean, just the energy on the first day is so great. I'm hoping that this carries forward in the next 14 days. I'm really excited. I think, I think that we're going to win this dispute. Uh, Amelia Organ, thank you for joining us on The Fix. You have your finger in two union pies, mm -hmm. the UCU and the NUS. And the NUS, yeah. Uh, both. Tell us about that. So that in the NUS you are? I'm the postgraduate taught rep on mm -hmm. NUS NEC. And you're in the UCU because you're a? PhD student. PhD student doing what? Philosophy. Ooh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, so fill us in on this UCU strike. Mm -hmm. It's all about pensions. Exactly, it's pensions. So there's this university, university superannuation scheme, um, and changes to that are going to mean that staff who are in that scheme, which is at pre-1992 universities, so that's academic and non-academic staff, are facing cuts of £10,000 per year to their pensions. Um, so they're out on strike. And that's because the universities have said they can no longer afford their current pension liabilities, the amount they're going to owe their yes. staff. And so they want to change it from a, this is where it gets wonky, so a mm -hmm. defined pension scheme to a contribution. Defined benefit to defined contribution. Defined benefit to defined contribution. And defined benefit means that you know how much you're going to receive. Mm -hmm. Defined contribution means you know how much they're going to give and then the stock market decides how much you get. It's like the whims the of the market, right? And they're saying there's a deficit, but it's based on really, really dodgy figures. So the model they've used is if all universities in the scheme, so this is pre-1992 universities, so a lot of them have a lot of money. Mm. So within their model, all of these universities collapse on the same day. It's, it's not going to happen. Um, and that's why they're saying that there's a deficit. Okay. Yeah, so it's, if you think of industries that are too big to fail, I mean, yeah. British universities, if they all failed at the same time, that wouldn't be very good for, for the economy or our no. international standing. I can't really see it happening. <laughs> Uh, one theory I read was that it was because Oxford and Cambridge especially, and a lot of blame has been going mm -hmm. on them, I'll ask you about that in a second, but it was the idea that they want to compete with American universities mm -hmm. in the amount of money they can raise on the financial markets, and you can okay. raise more money cheaply on the financial markets if you minimise your liabilities on things oh. like pensions. But what, is, what was the controversy about Oxford and Cambridge? People think the they've Oxford's had colleges. a lot to do with this strike. So... The Oxbridge Colleges got to contribute to this, to the, you know, put in their statements as employers, even though 
you know, the university, they do employ people, but as individual colleges, they don't even recognise unions. So they're, it's like, it's the same as the university challenge scandal is the way to understand mm. it. Scandal's a bit too strong for university challenge, but we all know that in university challenge, Oxford has an advantage, they've got more colleges, so they get to enter more times. The same thing has happened. But actually, some of the Oxbridge colleges are now saying, well, you know, some of the colleges with less money, who perhaps are less invested in making as much money as they can, mm. are saying, actually, this isn't what we wanted. So this is, um, yeah, this is playing out as well. So instead of Oxford and Cambridge voting, it was all their colleges, which is about 30 each, got to vote, so they yeah, yeah. outweighed everyone else. Exactly. And um, the responses seemed fairly strong, fairly united. Yeah. Uh, how many universities are we seeing strikes in? Are there any that didn't strike? 61 universities strike. Okay are going on strike, 14 day strike. It's the longest strike in the union's history. 88% um, of UCU members who were balloted voted for the strike. Which is huge, Impressive. huge numbers. And um, we're seeing like huge student support. The NUS has live policy on supporting the strike. Very different situation to in 2009, when the then president of NUS, Wes Streeting, um, said- A favorite of ours uh, in yeah, media. Yeah, yeah, good, good, <laughs> good boy, Wes Streeting. <laughs> what Wes Streeting said was, students uh, need a lecturer strike like a hole in the head, right? So, yeah, so we're seeing a big change wow. since then. We could be doing more, but things have changed a lot. We've got students across the country organising teach outs, um, standing in solidarity. I was on the King's Picket, King's College of London Picket earlier. It was great, loads of students there, loads of music. Um, teach outs, students would turn up, we'd explain to them what was going on, they'd go home, they'd WhatsApp mm. their mates, they'd tell them not to come to class. It's really, really, it's really positive, it's really inspiring. Yeah, no, it's really impressive, because I mean, obviously, a strike is most likely to lose if you can create some division amongst the workforce, Yeah. but the workforce is more likely to be divided if the students seem particularly upset, but 61% of students supported Support. the strike, which yeah, is yeah. an incredible figure. Exactly, and it will go higher. Yeah, it will go higher, it good, will go we higher. like that phrase as well. <laughs> uh, and all this is paying off, so the employers seem somewhat divided. So mm -hmm. initially the position of Universities UK, which is the alliance of all the universities, were saying this is our position. Yep. We want to impose these changes on the pension scheme. Since the strike started, a lot of those universities have changed their tune. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's happened there? What's your analysis? So the vice chancellors are speaking out. Um, I think 17, is it? 17 vice chancellors. I think it's 17 on Friday, yeah. It keeps going up. So, um, including Cambridge, Southampton, they're all saying, um, no, not Southampton, Newcastle. Southampton is where they had a flash occupation to try and get the um, vice chancellors to speak out against ah. it. So there's pressure from lots of angles. Yeah. The vice chancellors are saying, this isn't working. We need to pay our staff properly. This is, this is a crisis. Um, this is, you know, this, like, the universities are at breaking point. And what would winning mean? For the, for, the, mm -hmm. for the lecturers to win, would that mean that there's no changes at all or are they asking for slightly different changes to the ones currently being suggested? So given that the, the changes are based on a completely messed up model, it's demanding that, you know, pensions are kept the same. But this is about more than just pensions, right? This is about marketisation and neoliberalisation throughout higher education. So um, in real terms, uh, academics have had a pay cut of 15%, I think, um, since 2009, 52% of academics in Russell Group University, so the richest universities, are on temporary contracts. Mm. But there's money swishing around. Actually, right now, Channel 4 Dispatches, I think, is doing an expose on uh, VCs, vice chancellors' expenses. So we had Glynis Breakwell at Bath, who um, expense biscuits. Mm -hmm. she, she breaks well, apparently. So um, she was on 450k a year. And so, yeah. charges expenses for her biscuits, so the yeah. students pay for the biscuits. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know, this is so. Uh, this might. I don't know why. If this is if this is one of the reasons the VCs are you know more willing to speak out, it's because they know there's a storm brewing. Yeah. Let's talk about the next big uh, sort of crux points. Mm -hmm. So we've got this week three days of strike. The mm -hmm. following week four days of strike. Yep. The week after that five, five days of days. strike. What are the chances that something happens, which means those are called off? What's mm -hmm. going to be the likely point at which we can see whether this strike is going to escalate mm -hmm. or whether the management are going to give in to demand? So it's whether the UK will get back to the table um, and negotiate, which we're not seeing yet. Um, and, and that's that's going to be it, basically. And, and we've got 
Um, we've had huge support from students. We had a, a, a demo outside Universities UK today, big turnout. There's local things going on as well. There's another demo on Wednesday, so if you're in London, get yourself down. Um, and the main thing is keeping up momentum from students. That student worker solidarity is what's going to win this. It's the most important thing. And we have to remember that the same people who triple fees, the same people who are cutting our courses, are the ones that are slashing these pensions. And I think that's something that you know, we need to stand in solidarity with striking staff. Brilliant, thank you. Amelia Horgan, thank you. Uh, if you're a student, get out on the picket line. If you're a lecturer, get out on the picket line. And in the snow. In the snow. Strike mess. And we hope for the best. <laughs> uh, this was The Fix. We'll see you next week. Uh, for now, goodbye.